This video is part two of reviewing all of the structure and function of eukaryotic cells. Our goal is still the same as the first video. We need to be able to explain how cells are able to accomplish the fundamental characteristics of living things, how they're able to maintain homeostasis, interdependence, metabolism, evolution, reproduction, and heredity. Last time we looked at the first main or primary job of a cell, how it makes energy. It needs energy for all of its activities in order to clean up the waste that's produced while it's making that energy. The organelles that did this work was the cell membrane, and that was the boundary that controlled <clears throat> what entered and what exited the cell. Lysosomes, they are there as hydrilic enzyme containing vacuoles that are able to readily digest any materials that the cell needs to break down. Vacuoles and vesicles were the containers that would store and ship materials around the cell. And the mitochondria was able to make ATP energy from sugar in the presence of oxygen. Now we need to look at the remaining two jobs that cells do, specifically how cells are able to make proteins and how cells are able to make more cells. So let's look at job two. Cells need workers. They need proteins to run the daily life and growth of a cell. These proteins are gonna be there to read genes. Proteins are able to read DNA and then translate that code into proteins that can do work for the cell. These proteins also provide structure. This is what makes up muscle fibers, hair, skin, and claws. They're also enzymes. They're able to speed up and lower the cost for the chemical reactions that occur in a cell. They're also used as a signaling molecule. A protein can act as a hormone and send messages and be received at a receptor. The organelles involved in the work of producing proteins are the nucleus, ribosomes, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi apparatus. Once again, the proteins are the ones doing all of the work in the cell. The main reason is that they're the only ones that are going to be able to read DNA, convert it into different proteins, which then make up all of the structures in cells, the enzymes that do chemical reactions, the signals that are sent, and what is received. So let's look at the nucleus. The nucleus is found in all eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells do not have a nucleus. The primary function of the nucleus is to protect DNA. The nucleus is the storehouse of all of that material. Cells only have one set of their DNA, so those instructions need to be protected. Any change to that original DNA is a change that will sustain throughout the entire life of that cell. The structure of the nucleus is a double membrane with pores, and you can see the pores in this image here. The pores are there because frequently there are things moving in and out of the nucleus. Signaling molecules will move in to trigger the reading of a gene, and ribosomes and RNA will come out. Inside the nucleus is another structure called the nucleolus. It's a small circle you can see inside of it. The sole purpose of the nucleolus is to produce ribosomes. On a cell diagram, could you find the nucleus? It's the largest structure when looking at a eukaryotic cell. The nucleus is the overarching structure. The small circle inside of it is the nucleolus. Its job is to produce ribosomes, and this is where DNA is stored in the cell. So those ribosomes that the nucleolus are making are found in every type of cell, prokaryotic, animal, and plant. The primary function of the ribosome is to produce protein. That's why we find it in all kinds of cells. All living things need to make protein to carry out the functions to sustain themselves. These ribosomes work by reading out the directions that are found in DNA, which will specify the specific kind of protein that is produced. That happens in a process called transcription and translation, which we'll learn about later in this class. The structure of a ribosome is different than the other organelles. The other eukaryotic organelles are membrane bound, meaning they're made primarily of membrane, whereas a ribosome only has two units. So it's found in two different places as well. Some of it is free floating in the cytoplasm and other parts are attached to another organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. A ribosome has two subunits. It has a large subunit, that's the larger part on the top, and a small subunit on the bottom. It's currently debated if ribosomes actually even are an organelle because their constituent parts are so different than the other membranous organelles we've looked at, like vacuoles and vesicles. 
On a cell diagram, ribosomes can be found everywhere. All of these small circles are the free-floating ribosomes, and the ones attached to those membranous folds around the nucleus are the ones attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. The primary job of ribosomes is to build proteins. So the endoplasmic reticulum is our next organelle involved in the production of protein, and it's actually found in two different varieties inside of cells, and the endoplasmic reticulum is frequently abbreviated as just ER. It's found in all eukaryotic cells. One variety is smooth ER. The primary function of smooth ER is to build cell membrane. It also detoxifies the cell. So if the cell is filled with toxins, the smooth ER is going to be there to break that down. Its structure is membranous folds. And the reason why it's called smooth ER, you can see it right here, is it appears smooth. It kind of looks like a coral reef under the microscope. The other variety of endoplasmic reticulum is called rough ER. The function of the rough ER is to fold proteins. Remember that proteins start at a primary structure, then they have to go to the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. The rough ER is going to aid in that folding from primary, secondary, and onward. Its structure is a membranous fold, but the reason why we refer to it as being rough is because it has ribosomes attached to it. Those attached ribosomes make it appear bumpy or rough when looking at it under close magnification. On a cell diagram, to isolate the ER, the ER is always found around the nucleus, and there's a reason for that. The primary role of the endoplasmic reticulum is folding those proteins and making membrane instructions that are going to be received from the DNA in the nucleus, so it wants to be as close as possible. Here you can see both varieties. The smooth right here detoxifies and makes membrane, and the rough attached directly to the nucleus has ribosomes attached and is involved in protein folding. Next up is the Golgi apparatus, which again is found in only eukaryotic cells. The primary function of the Golgi apparatus is to finish, sort, label, and package proteins. This is the UPS of the cell. It's going to be receiving products such as proteins, packaging them, folding them, and sending them to their designated destination. It will do this by packaging into vesicles and sending out into vesicles. And that's a key way of noticing where the Golgi is on a cell diagram. They're usually depicted with vesicles moving in and out of them. Its structure is a membranous sac. This is a membrane-bound organelle, so it is made of membrane. On a cell diagram, you can see the Golgi right there. It is further away from the nucleus than the endoplasmic reticulum. has a lot of infolds, but no attached ribosomes. So let's put this all together and go through the steps of manufacturing a protein from the DNA blueprint onward to shipping a protein out of the cell into the bloodstream. So we're going to start with the nucleus. The DNA in the nucleus is going to be transcribed into RNA, which is just a blueprint containing the directions found in DNA. That blueprint will go to the rough endoplasmic reticulum where it'll be read by ribosomes. Those ribosomes are going to read that blueprint and use it to make a primary protein. You can see a polypeptide chain formed here. As it progresses through the endoplasmic reticulum, it'll be folded and it'll be packaged into a vesicle. That vesicle will then move onward to a Golgi apparatus. That Golgi apparatus is going to continue to fold that protein. You can see it here moving from secondary to tertiary and quaternary. And then it'll be packaged and sent to where it needs to go. In this example, we're going to send it out of the cell into the bloodstream. So that vesicle will move out, merge with the bloodstream, and go where it needs to go. Just like how all life is interdependent, so too are the organelles inside the cell. They all need to work together in order to accomplish a task. Our next job is the cell needs to be able to make more cells. All living things reproduce. This can happen either because the organism is growing or perhaps a cell is broken down and is decaying and dying and a replacement needs to be born. For this to happen, the cell needs to be able to copy its DNA and make extra organelles. There is one primary organelle that's involved in this, and that is the centriole. The centrioles are found only in animal cells. They're the churros of the cell. I mean, look at them. That's a churro. They help coordinate cell division or cell reproduction. 
they are a pair of microtubules in structure. The way they work is when a cell is going to divide, it needs to copy and split its cellular contents, particularly its DNA. To do that, like you can see in the diagram in the bottom left, the centrioles are going to produce fibers called spindle fibers that will attach to chromosomes, structures containing DNA, and split them apart so that each new cell that's produced has the same DNA blueprint. In a cell diagram, just look for the churros to find the centriole. Again, they're only involved in cell division. They make spindle fibers out of microtubules. There's a couple more structures I want to cover before we move on from cellular structure and function that relate specifically to protection and motion in cells. First is the cell wall. The cell wall is not only found in plant cells. Bacteria, prokaryotes also have cell walls. The purpose of the cell wall is to protect the cell and give it more of a rigid structure to protect it and to support it in the case of plant cells. In plant cells, it's made out of a carbohydrate called cellulose, and in bacteria, it's made out of a compound called peptioglycan. Why do you think animal cells don't have a cell wall? Wouldn't it be advantageous for all life to have this extra level of protection? Well, the downside of the cell wall is it restricts your movement. If you have that cell wall, you're very rigid. That cell is very sturdy. It's not fluid, so it can't move or respond to stress as well as an animal cell can. Another structure to keep in mind that's found in all cell types is the cytoskeleton. We have a cell skeleton to support all of our organs and keep us upright, so too do cells. The cytoskeleton provides shape and structure to cells, and it's going to be involved in holding organelles in place and moving them around. The structure is made of tiny tubes called microtubules and tiny filaments, sometimes called filaments, other times called microfilaments. And you can see in this image here how they form a scaffold to hold everything in place and that these tubules can be used to ship and move objects around in the cell. For the entire cell to be able to move, structures called flagella and cilia facilitate that movement. These are protrusions of microtubules that can be built in a variety of ways and move in a variety of ways to get that cell to move around. This is found in all cell types, but not in all kinds of cells. To explain a little bit about the difference between the two, cilia are tiny hairs that are typically found covering the entire cell. A cell can move by beating these very rapidly. To show you an example in your body, your lungs actually have cilia. These tiny hairs are constantly beating up and outward to get debris and mucus out of your lungs. Other cells, mostly bacteria, but in humans we find it in things like sperm cells, will have one very long or multiple very long tubules that can beat in a propeller-like motion. That motion can help the cell propel into the opposite direction, and it can also be used to crawl in the forward direction, the direction that the flagella is in. So this covers the three jobs of cells. We reviewed how they make energy using the nucleus, mitochondria, lysosomes, and vacuoles, how they're able to make proteins using ribosomes, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi, and how centrioles are involved in making more cells. I hope this introduction was helpful in understanding the structure and function of all cells and how they're able to interdependently work together to meet the criteria of a living thing. I'll see you next time.